And so I'm sort of looking at timing. We're recording. Okay, so we're going to get started. So I'm going to give you guys just a little bit of a background on where we've been. Um, Alec and I had a long conversation on Friday. He knows uh, what we've been up to. He knows you've watched the Frontline documentary. He knows that you have read part of the Court of Appeals opinion. Uh, he knows that Evan Hughes came in to class. Uh, he knows my scheme uh, to get you to write questions that you might have for him before you knew that he was going to come to class. Uh, the questions have all been shared um, with Alec ahead of time, so he knows what questions are coming. When we first started having conversations about him attending um, a business school class, he expressed um, a strong interest in doing it in a questions and answers way as opposed to him making a speech. Um, and so I think this makes a great deal more sense for you as the students. Um, and we spent like at least three full lectures talking about sort of business and corporate ethics um, to be in the best position to ask him questions. Um, and before we get started, you know, I, I think maybe it would just be appropriate to turn it over to Alec for a minute uh, or so, and you know, he can sort of maybe introduce himself briefly. Um, you, you've met him only through the Frontline documentary, and that really isn't um, a sum total of anyone's life. Uh, people have had lives that have gone on you know, way beyond that. Um, and maybe, Alec, if you're comfortable just talking for just a couple minutes about, you know, tell us just about yourself. Where did you grow up? What type of education um, do you have? This is Alec Berlikoff. Uh, I grew up in uh, Long Island, New York, in a small town called Kings Park. Hang on, let me shut this phone off. I thought I did shut it off. Okay, uh, give me a second. Hang on. All right, so I grew up with mom and dad. Uh, they stayed married until I got to college, and then they were divorced. I had an older brother. Um, I was a good student. Uh, always got good grades, took school seriously. I went to college, undergrad uh, at Florida State University, got a bachelor's in psychology, uh, graduated with almost a 4.0, and then um, and my summers through college, I worked at a car dealership selling cars and um, on Christmas break and so forth and so on. My dad and my brother were in car sales. Uh, after college, I started selling cars, realized that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. Quickly went into graduate school at FIU in Miami and started working on a master's in social work, which I did get. Um, after that, I started to work in education. I was teaching physical education, um, K through eighth, eighth grade. And then shortly then after, I got a guidance counselor job, a full-time guidance counselor job at a high profile private school, uh, very affluent children. I was coaching high school basketball and working as a guidance counselor in education. I loved working with the kids. Um, I was very happy. Unfortunately, um, money, you know, and the desire to make more got the best of me. I realized that I wasn't going to make the kind of money that I thought I needed to make uh, in order to feel good about myself and to get the respect that I thought um, that came along with money. So, uh, interesting story. One of the uh, pivotal point for me leaving education. I was working the parking lot carpool lane and we had a non-smoking policy at school. There was a affluent father picking up his daughter, driving a Bentley convertible, smoking a cigar. I walked out there and respectfully asked him to put it out. He blowed the, uh, the smoke in my face after taking another puff and said petty rules from petty people. And that was just kind of for me. Uh, the icing on the cake that basically propelled me to try to get into sales, uh, pharmaceutical sales specifically, where I thought um, I could make some money. So uh, I took a job in pharmaceutical sales. Uh, my first job was with Eli Lilly and Company. Uh, they had an extensive training program, very science oriented. 
I sold Prozac and Zyprexa, which is an atypical antipsychotic. So I was still working in the psychology social work field at that point and still very what still very much on what I thought was a good path for me. But once I got into sales and uh, got the competitive spirit and got uh, a taste of the money, you know, the product in which I was representing or selling the science behind it and those things, they kind of went by the wayside. And, you know, it, it became all about you know, what company could I work for that would pay me the most? How could I become, you know, the number one rep and so forth and so on. And, you know, that's just kind of where everything honestly just went off the rails for me. Um, so, you know, for me, you know, going through what I went through for me was a lot, you know, a lot, some people may have experienced this and been indicted and gone to prison and, you know, may have the attitude that, you know, it was no big deal. It comes with the territory. I ran into people like that in prison who felt that way. I didn't even feel that way at all. For me, it was a miserable experience, a humbling experience, uh, brought me a lot of pain and suffering as well as my family and something that, you know, I, if I could do it all over again, certainly would not have, um, you know, went the way that I went and taken the risk that I took. Um, that landed me in this predicament in which, you know, I will be uh, reminded of and dealing with for the rest of my life. So, I so think that's, that's a good amount for now, right? Great question. And um, so, yeah, my belief is that the role of the company is to benefit the uh, profit for the shareholders. Um, based on my experience, you know, I've seen a number of people throughout my tenure raise objections uh, as it pertains to rules, regulations, compliance, morals, ethics. And based on what I've seen, you know, 99% of the time, um, they're basically pushed aside. And, you know, it's the bottom line, the mighty dollar that ultimately wins that battle, if you will. Um, and you know, if you're not willing to get in line, you will be um, discarded. Andrew, you're up next. All right, Alec, thank, thank you uh, for joining us today. My question is, you mentioned in the PBS Frontline documentary that you've always wanted to work with a billionaire, uh, and you got that opportunity with John Kapoor. I was wondering if you could please describe your sales ethics before you arrived at INCES. Um, thank you. Sure. So my sales ethics before I arrived at INCES, to be perfectly honest with you, were not, they just were non-existent. They were neither here nor there. Um, I just never really took ethics into consideration. I never attempted to have ethics and sales in the same conversation. Um, you know, I wanted to work for a billionaire, but I never worked for a billionaire before. Okay. So I had no idea what to expect. You know, I, I thought that it was going to be great and it was going to be uh, a tremendous learning experience and so forth. Um, and I have nothing to compare him to. I've only worked for that one, but you know, my takeaway is, you know, when you work for someone who literally is a billionaire, they, they, they're shrewd, you know, and they, they just, they're completely black and white in order to make that kind of money. And, I guess it was something that I needed to get out of my system to because it was a, a burning desire to see what that was all about. But now that I have, I know that I never want to work for a billionaire again. Um, you know, maybe I hope that working for a billionaire might help me shape my ethics. But, you know, like I said, I didn't really have any, any real ethics per se before. Um, I had some lines that I had never crossed or that I thought I would never cross. 
And um, but I but they were still in the gray, and you know, working for a billionaire, all that. The catalyst for me working for a billionaire was is that I was crossing those lines even more and more so, going further and further over the line. Hogan. Yeah, Alec, I was curious, um, was it the pressure from John Kapoor or just the general pursuit of wealth and success that mostly motivated your actions? Um, it was both. You know, you got to understand that John Kapoor was, you know, was a brilliant man. You know, he made some mistakes, you know, sure. Um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? But he was a brilliant man. And part of what made him brilliant was he knew, you know, what to look for in people in order to get what he wanted. So he knew in me and from my past and my experience and our conversations that I was extremely motivated by money and success and power. And that's why he hired me because he pushed all of the right buttons in order to get me to do, you know, exactly what he wanted. So it was a combination of both. Yes. Okay, next two are very related questions. So Ellis and Angelina, um, they'll both read their questions, and you'll, you'll see because you've got them in front of you. They're very much related. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to start with asking how you, in the documentary, you say that you successfully compartmentalized um, the damage that was being done, and you referenced widgets. Uh, I was going to ask how you specifically did that, and if there was a specific point where you can look back and identify that line being crossed. And the related question, Angelina? My question is that you must have rationalized your conduct. Um, could you maybe walk us through how you have rationalized it? and? if there was any cost and benefit analysis that you have conducted on your perspective, and more importantly, like what are the costs that you have um, analyzed? Thank Great. you. Thank you. Oh, that's a lot to, that's a lot to uh, remember. All right, let's start off with the compartmentalizing. Um, yeah, so you learn to be effective in sales that regardless of what you're selling, you sell it in the same manner. So, you know, I'd learned long, long before I came to interest that, you know, you focus less on the product that you're selling and more on you. You are the product. First, you sell yourself to the customer. And then if they buy into you, then they may actually buy into the product. The product is actually secondary. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, I did not make a conscious decision to go sell fentanyl. You know, I'm not here to shy away from taking responsibility for the, the, the harm that I caused. But I, I will tell you that, you know, I have sold every product the exact same way. And, you know, I, I, I wish that I had not been offered this particular position with a company that happened to sell a Schedule II opium. And also, as far as compartmentalizing, part of what I did was I just flat out chose to ignore, you know, anything that was around me that could be concerning. You know, I saw I, my whole career, I've seen, I've always tried to uh, block out any distractions to being successful. I, everything, you know, other than you selling yourself and the product is a distraction. That's sales. That's business. So, you know, I would hear whispers of, you know, a doctor getting in trouble or, you know, a patient, you know, um, ending up in the ER or even worse. And looking back, I realized that it was my responsibility because of the role that I held to look into it further and to research it on my own and to find out the answers to, you know, these questions that were looming over us. And I did just the opposite. You know, I was disciplined in the fact that I said, oh, whoa, 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 that's going to distract me. That's going to 
um, take me away from leading the charge of the sales force and it's going to potentially you know get the better of my conscience conscience so what I need to do is not pull it up on the internet not ask the doctor to tell me what happened with that particular patient not read that particular article and so that is how I got by and there were times where I was I couldn't I, I couldn't resist you know we're human right we all are gonna falter <laughs> there were times where I did ask the CEO Mike Babich or the owner you know John Kapoor hey you know what happened with dr. so-and-so you know I heard this and when I did you know they just kind of barked at me and said you know stay in your lane like you're in sales like focus on the sales you know that's not for you to be concerned with so everything that I was taught about being a sales leader came to fruition when I did ask questions so it was a combination of me insulating myself and doing everything I could to avoid the negative that was going on around me and then my superiors doing everything they could to ensure that I was not privy to that type of information but again the key takeaway is it is it was my responsibility I'm an adult and I would tell that to anybody getting into any industry that if you get any sense that something is going on that is no good you know you cannot just go to your superior look for an answer and if they don't provide it say oh okay it's fine I asked you know so and so and no no that clearly that's not going to work it, it's on you you know uh, and I should have done that and I didn't um, and to the second part of the question I rationalized I rationalized that I took the necessary measures to try to find out what was going on and that's just nonsense you know it was a it was a, a poor effort on my part um, I was almost hoping that they would tell me you know to not concern myself with it and stay in my lane and focus on the sales I got the answers I was looking for and I went on my merry way and I justified it you know as as that it was not my problem you know that I was not first in charge and so forth so um, I also I also rationalized it by saying um, you know by just not taking responsibility you know just by saying hey you know I'm not the doctor you know the doctor took a Hippocratic oath to do what's in the best interest of the patient he's the one with the medical license he's the one prescribing it you know, I'm not the pharmacy. I'm not the I'm not the ones that are dispensing it. When clearly the patients that are showing up at CVS or Walgreens are not, you know, they're they're, they're not presenting well. They they clearly look as if something's not. I mean, there's there were signs everywhere, um, and you know, I chose to ignore them, and I chose to place the blame on others. Uh, Alec, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is Todd, I'm going to go off script just for a minute because the, sure. the last couple of things you said are really interesting. And last year, it, one quarter, we spent a lot of time in another class sort of tracking Empire of Pain uh, and some of the large uh, McKesson type intermediary drug companies. When you no. were, when you were at Insys, um, did, did the staff at Insys, did they have a sense of what was going on in the world relating to Purdue Pharma and some of these drug intermediaries that were getting in trouble for sending lots and lots of opioids to pharmacies, that, and then the pharmacies were, were, were selling you know, millions of pills. So in other words, I'm sort of curious whether from the perch at Insys, whether you all were paying attention to what was happening in the opioid market relating to Purdue Pharma and their problems, or whether or not you sort of weren't paying attention to that, even though you were in the same industry. Right. So, I mean, looking back, you know, how could we have missed that? Um, but those conversations never came up. You know, they never took place. You know, it was, it, you, you know, 
most of, you know, the culture of a company typically does come from the top. And, you know, our culture, you know, came from John Kapoor. And it was not to talk about anything that would be construed as negative or um, contradictory to the results that we were trying to achieve. You know, but I will say this, Todd, again, looking back, you know, I mean, if you read the hard sell, um, I mean, they, they allude to it. And I don't really get very, very in depth to it. But, you know, there were doctors who negotiated with Insys to have us bypass the intermediary or the wholesaler. Yeah. So not to ship to Cardinal, Amerisaurus, or um, uh, McKesson, but to actually ship directly to them. So to, to, to directly distribute to the doctor who actually happened to own pharmacies. And they were asking us to do that because the wholesalers in these situations were actually putting quantity limits on them because they were so egregious. It was so obvious that they were inappropriately prescribing and dispensing. Um, in fact, uh, it came to trial, uh, Dr. Kapoor, you know, approved direct distribution to, you know, some of these key physicians um, to allow them to egregiously prescribe. You know, so, you know, there were, there were, uh, there were stops in place and there's a way to navigate every stop, right? There's a way to get around. And if there was a way to get around, you know, that's typically what we did. We, we found a way to circumvent instead of saying, wait, this is in place for our good reason. And in the end of the day, it's going to protect everybody. Instead, we said, oh, that's getting in the way of sales. So how do we circumvent that? That was the entire uh, culture of the company. Um, terrific answer. I want to just double back and make sure students understand it because I'm tracking what you're saying because I've read the book, but I want to make sure students understand it. So if you think about the pharmaceutical industry, we've got the drug company that makes the pharmaceuticals, and then there are three giant intermediary companies that basically move the pharmaceuticals from the manufacturing company to their own warehouse, and then they in turn sell and move the pharmaceuticals to Bartell Drugs down the street. And it's that intermediary company, um, and Alec was just mentioning it, one of which is a company called McKesson. McKesson has these obligations by federal law that they need to keep track of where they're sending medications and flag the government if massive amounts of medications, for instance, were going to the Bartels on the Ave, you know, if for some reason the little drug Bartels on the Ave, if they got like boatloads of opioids, um, McKesson would have to flag the government. And what Alec just described is cutting out the middleman and doctors wanting to say, no, don't send them to McKesson, send them right from Insys to us. And that way there won't be that intermediary that has that obligation to report things to the government. Um, is, uh, is Kim here? Where's Kim? Is Kim here today? I don't think she's here today. So one of the students is not here today who had a question. Um, Alec, okay. and I'll summarize it. It's the next question on the list. And it has to do with distance. And the theory is that the further you are, not you particularly, but anybody, the further anyone is away from the potential consequences of a decision that's ethically on the borderline, the further you are away from the consequences, um, <coughs> the less likely your, your opinion or view is shaped by the consequences. So the thrust is, you know, does distance matter? And I think you've already talked a little bit about that indirectly as you talked about rationalization and compartmentalization. But just speak to a minute uh, about distance. And as you have that thought in your mind, um, Charles is going to sort of have the second part of the question. And together, they'll kind of make sense. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Alec, for coming in to speak to us today. Uh, I'm just wondering if you ever saw like the firsthand impacts that your sales tactics were having on society. Um, and if so, did you ever feel any empathy towards the people who were facing those impacts? Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, the, the distance 
office, you know, so to speak, that they make it their business to find out what's going on, you know, as opposed to do the opposite and say, oh, you know, that's, that's not, that's not my job. That's not important. You know, um, distance is critical. Yeah, distance in, in any crime, you know, allows somebody to go to the lengths, you know, necessary to, to execute, quite frankly. Um, you know, in, in my situation, you know, even though I did make it my business every week to go out and get on a plane and get in a territory and get in a car with a rep and visit the, these physicians, um, I still was distant because I never, I never actually witnessed, you know, the doctor prescribing the medication or the doctor having a conversation with the patient's spouse who's crying and begging the doctor to stop prescribing because they don't know who their husband is anymore. It, they can't even recognize the person. You know, I hear these horror stories now. Um, but, you know, I wasn't privy to them back then. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. The, the, the question that uh, the gentleman just asked, what, Todd? Whether you actually ever, uh, and I think you've already sort of addressed it, that you weren't in the room when uh, doctors prescribed anything. And I think the second part of the question would be, you know, did you ever have contact with a patient that was getting subsis? Um, in a way that, you know, later you thought, okay, that was an inappropriate way for the patient to get subsis. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the answer is no, not, not me, but I know a lot of my reps, you know, did come in contact with patients, but it was the doc, the doctors always had those reps come in contact with the patients who had great things to say, right? They wanted the rep to feel good. They wanted everybody to be warm and fuzzy and be happy and smile. You know, the doctors, they did a great job of shielding us from, you know, the negative stuff. They didn't want us to hear that. They didn't want us to judge the doctor. They didn't want us to stop utilizing the doctor to speak on our medication. Everybody wanted to make it look like everything was fantastic. And it, it clouded everyone's judgment. I mean, there was a time, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost embarrassing to think back that there was a time where I would literally walk around with my head held high and a smile on my face, actually telling people that we're doing a great thing and that, you know, we are changing patients' lives and we're taking these people who are in excruciating pain, who had no quality of life, who were lying in bed all day and they weren't interacting with their kids, they weren't doing homework with their children, they weren't attending their kids, you know, baseball, you know, all these things. Those were the stories I was telling. I never was talking about these horror stories that have eventually, you know, come to light. And yes, do I have empathy? Tremendous empathy. I mean, you know, I know that there are people out there in this world that you know, read about me or have heard about me and think I'm a monster, you know, um, there's nothing I can do to change that. But I, you know, you're asking me and I'm telling you that, you know, it, it's heartbreaking, you know. Um, now, you know, when I was sentenced, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't have, they didn't have patience there uh, to talk to me and tell me, you know, the horror that they went through. But I know that when John Kapoor was sentenced, they did. And that must have been, you know, a bone chilling experience. And I know that if it had happened to me, you know, I would have broke, I would have broken down, you know, for sure. Um, I have, I have tremendous empathy. I mean, and I haven't had the perfect life myself. And I, I do know what it's like to be in pain and to suffer. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't wish that type of pain, you know, on anybody. So, so we're going to shift gears just a little bit uh, to corporate culture and sales. And Vanessa and Ellis have uh, questions that really go kind of in a different direction. The direction is, 
the people that you hired to come in as part of the sales force at INSYS and who you were looking for and, and why. Uh, going back to the idea of um, successfully compartmentalizing um, in yourself, how did you manage to like indoctrinate or teach the rest of your sales team uh, to successfully adopt those sales practices? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so as far as hiring, I mean, you know, with a bachelor's in psych and a master's in social work, you know, I was very good at tailoring, you know, and formulating the right questions to draw those conclusions. So, you know, I came up with my own interview questions, uh, you know, with the help of John Kapoor and his approval. Uh, we had certain questions that we would ask, you know, um, John Kapoor's favorite question was, uh, what's more important to you? So I would ask every person on an interview this question. What's more important to you, integrity or loyalty? That was a critical question and would speak a thousand words. You know, and I, I, I guess I would ask you all, I mean, you're in a business ethics class. I would think you would all say integrity, but I can tell you at INSYS that if you said integrity, you did not get the job. So, um, if you said loyalty, I knew that you know you could be asked if we took good care of you and we paid you well and we delivered on what we promised on, you know, uh, prior to you actually taking the position, that you would reciprocate and you would do what we asked you to do. Um, so that's that's a great example. All right, I, I'm not going to go through all of the questions, but it was those types of questions that we were looking for. Um, you know, I would have a, a piece of paper, I would draw a box, and, and then I would say, um, you know, here's the line, you know, and I'd draw it right across the box, and I'd say, how, here's the line that you don't want to cross, and then I, I'd give them a pen, and I'd say, all right, I want you to draw a dot showing me how close you would get to that line. Right? And if they were like literally like right on that line, I'm like, okay, this is somebody we want to hire. Um, some people would literally go right over the line. They would draw a dot over the line. I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is perfect. You know, there, there were some people that were way, way, you know, like on the other side, like, oh no, like that's, you know, I'm not going anywhere near that line. Right? So, you know, that's, and that gives you an indication of what kind of company you're joining and the culture of that company. And, you know, there, there were people in the interview process that were very smart and savvy and probably people like yourself who have taken business ethics classes who, who were like, I mean, I remember someone said to me, uh, he answered the question. He said, I said, loyalty or integrity? He said, integrity. And I said, oh, okay, great. I said, great answer. I said, why not loyalty? He said, well, loyalty can take you right to jail. That was three years before, um, you know, we even had any inkling that we were going to be under investigation. You know, that guy didn't get the job, right? <laughs> he didn't get the job. And he wouldn't have been successful at INSYS. But he certainly, you know, understands, you know, that we were delivering on a culture that he didn't want to be any part of. Um, sales is, is a tough profession. You know, my daughter is a junior at Penn State. And, you know, she originally told me she wanted to sell. So I've done everything in my power to talk her out of it. And I, I mean, we didn't talk for like two months. Um, and, you know, finally she's out and she's not doing it. Um, not to say that you can't go into sales and and be ethical and be successful, but you really need, you, your, your options are going to really be limited and you need to represent a product that you have investigated and researched 10 ways to Tuesday to ensure that this product, you know, does not do any harm. Um, and the majority of products that are out there that are available to sell, you know, are actually the opposite, you know. Um, that's what I found. Okay, a related question that's sort of on that same wavelength. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, thank you for coming with, uh, to us today. So my question is, did you see like the salespeople who are unable to follow through? Um, and how did the, 
how did this play out? Okay, so for me, I understood that, okay, and this was goes, goes back to the, original, the other question right before too. Not everyone we hired met the criteria. You know, we understood that, you know, the majority of entry level salespeople would literally just be appointment setters. That the tough conversation, right, the difficult dialogue uh, around, you know, the shady tactics that we were implor um, imploring were going to take place by management, directors, and executives. So, you know, not the majority of the people with the company, quite frankly, you know, were not engaging in, you know, criminal activity. Um, but the managers and the directors, unfortunately, they, they took it too far. You know, I hired the directors and managers and I told them, listen, you're going to be the ones having the difficult conversations. Don't push on your sales reps. You know, they're young, they're innocent, they're entry level. Just have them set the appointments for you. You do the hard work. Unfortunately, things, things take, a, take on a life of their own. And the company grew. I mean, we started with 40 reps and then we ended up with 500. And the managers and directors, they started making a lot of money and their ego started to grow and they started to get promoted and they started to push and they started to push on the sales reps and the sales reps that weren't producing and doing the things that I hired my managers and directors to do, the managers started to push them out the door. Um, there's so many things that go on in sales, you know, things take on a life of their own. It's, it, it, it truly is hard to control. You know, I knew that things were going on that shouldn't have been going on. Um, but e there are people in executive positions that don't know and still get in trouble. I mean, and they're still responsible. That's just the way it goes. Um, you know, a friend of mine that I went to high school and college with that I hired as a director to do so the so-called dirty work called me and said he wanted, to, he wanted to fire a sales rep because basically she wasn't doing, you know, these types of things that shouldn't, you know, that are shady, gray at best. And I said, and I said, no, do not fire this sales rep. Um, just leave her be. We don't, we're doing well. We don't need the aggravation. Don't, don't push so hard. And I, in fact, I said, I said, she is, um, she is of a specific ethnic group, right? So um, she was pregnant. I'm like, this is a recipe for disaster. She is going to sue. And he pushed and he pushed and some other things came into play. Long story short, um, I allowed it to take, I allowed, allowed it to happen. Well, she was one of the whistleblowers. Now, if it wasn't her, it would have been someone else. And it was someone else, you know, I mean, there were others, but she was the first from what from my understanding. So um, it's just amazing how, you know, things could start really, really small and, and, and it's, you know, you, you come to work and you're drinking your Starbucks and you think everything's fine. And one bad decision could turn into, you know, just a whole world of hell, to be honest with you. Um, so... But yeah, I never intended to have the entire company work in this regard. I always felt that it would be a limited number of people and that's all that we needed. And that, you know, we really shouldn't push too hard at the lower levels. Um, but again, you know, as the company grew and we, we made more money and managers got promoted to directors, directors got promoted to VPs and, and you know, and then you just lose control. On Tuesday, we had a really nice conversation with Evan Hughes. And one of the people that we talked about toward the end of the conversation was Sunrise Lee. And in many ways, I, I think of her as a fascinating 
employee to look at because when she arrived at INSYS, she had no experience in the pharmaceutical industry, um, though she certainly had sort of lots of, you know, different experiences that would probably help her in, in sales. And so the conversation we had with Evan was, you know, how was it that someone with a complete blank slate when it comes to ethics within the pharmaceutical sales practice, how was it that she was brought into it and she ended up where she was at the end? And Evan gave us his take, and I'm curious what your take is. And in, in many ways, as I look around with 60 students in this class, nobody in this class has any experience selling pharmaceuticals. Nobody understands the true ethics rules about you know, doctors prescribing things off-brand, but pharmaceutical companies not being able to advertise things off-brand. And Sunrise Lee is kind of a proxy, in my mind, for naive people who are starting out in business that don't know the real true rules within a particular industry, and then how that person goes from a blank slate to operating differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, do your students know the, the Sunrise Lee story? or Well, they know what they learned from the documentary. That's probably pretty much all they know. Right. I mean, Sunrise Lee... Is a, is a very interesting story. I mean, first and foremost, I am a firm believer that you don't need a formal education to be successful in sales. You know, and that in itself is controversial. And in that regard, I am controversial. Um, you know, and back to one of your students' questions, you know, what are you looking for in sales for people? I mean, you're looking for people that are hungry, that are driven and they're motivated and that they want to shop because if they feel like they've never gotten a shot in the past and you give them that shot, they're going to be much more likely to do, you know, these unconventional things that you're asking them to do and to cross lines. And, you know, that, that was a key ingredient in what we were looking for, you know, at, at Insys. Um, you know, you, you're looking for people that don't ask why. That, do, that just do because they're appreciative of the opportunity that's on the table. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it, it makes them kind of an easy mark. Um, I mean, Sunrise was, you know, she came from basically nothing. She emancipated herself at 16. I mean, just that in itself, hearing that she emancipated herself at 16, to know what it takes to emancipate yourself. You have to prove to the judge that you can take care of yourself at 16 years old. That, those are the types of things, just, I mean, so, you know, like on an interview, that to me is much more important than that you have a college degree from Harvard. I mean, in sales, it's all about motivation, hard work, passion, enthusiasm. You know, those, it, it's all about these intangibles that you're looking for. It's not like you know, going, you know, to be, you know, pre-law or, you know, pre-med or it, it's just different. Um, and then Sunrise, she had, in my opinion, the background that is necessary to be successful. I mean, you've got to be, you got to be a people person. You have to know how to interact. You have to be a good listener. You have to be comfortable, you know, um, in uncomfortable situations. And she clearly has that, had that background. Um, you know, I always, she was probably the most extreme example of people that I gave an opportunity to, but there were so many like that. Again, you know, back to one of your other students' questions, like, how did you know what you're looking for? And you, you realize once you find one and it goes well, then you try to find more. Um, you know, she was an adult entertainer, um, but there were others, you know, this guy, uh, this guy Jeff, um, who was literally selling, uh, you know, concert tickets on eBay at home. And, you know, there was another guy who <laughs> he... He had a felony charge for selling marijuana. And I was like, okay, this guy's entrepreneurial. This guy 
you know, he made a ton of money. He knows how to get it done. He's a risk taker. And he, you know, he ended up in, you know, he got in trouble. And he wants to do something. He wants to better himself and better his life. And my, my guess is he probably went on a million interviews and no one gave him a shot. Immediately said, you have a felony, you're out. And so I went to HR and I, I told him the situation and I was like, I want to give this guy a shot. You know, so it's just, I'll tell you, I thought that I was being uh, extremely intelligent, you know, but you realize that at least in pharmaceuticals and definitely in an industry where you're selling an opiate, that, that's, that was one of my biggest problems. I don't know what I was thinking. I never stopped to say, you're selling a schedule to opioid. You're selling fentanyl. You're selling something that, you know, is arguably the most deadly thing in the world. Again, for me, it was the widget. I'm selling a widget, and how do I sell as many of them as I possibly can? Oh, I can hire this person. I can hire that. Anybody that was basically, you know, going to be extremely appreciative of the opportunity because... So many people had judged them in the past and wouldn't give them an opportunity. Um, I would that to me they were they were perfect. Um, and had I been doing something else that wasn't as controversial and as heavily regulated, um, maybe I would have been very successful. Um, you know, I was successful initially, short term, until the other shoe dropped, and you know that was a complete debacle and disaster. Um, but it's just, for me, it's just an amazing story that I continue to relive in, in my head. How could I not be aware of what was going on with the opioid epidemic and fentanyl? And, you know, how could I be so oblivious? Because that's what makes me so irresponsible. That I hired people that were basically following us with blind faith because I was giving them an opportunity that no one else basically would give them. The uh, whole thing is a recipe for disaster. Last question sort of on the sales piece and then we'll move on to, to something else. And you and I, Alec, we talked about this on Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's room. There's room. I mean, the old me would have said no. But you know, I'd like to believe that there is room and there are opportunities for people who can be tremendous salespeople and do it in an ethical manner as well. Um, you know, it's okay to make money, right? I mean, you buy a pen for a dollar and you sell it for a dollar fifty. I mean, that doesn't make you unethical. That just makes you businesslike. Um, but the pen needs to work. And it make and the pen needs to be safe and not cause any harm. And that's why, again, earlier in the conversation, I alluded to, you know, look, I'm a convicted felon, and you know, I spent the last two years looking for opportunities. I was offered many, and the majority of them in sales, based on my research, the majority of them were unethical. They were not good products, and um, there was plenty of money to be made in them. But you know, I don't want to end back. I don't want to end up back in prison. So I, I'm positive that the majority of those opportunities are not are, are going to uh, get in the way of you being ethical. But again, yes, there is a place for both. They're just more limited. You have to be much more selective and you have to be much more detail-oriented as it pertains to the research that you're going to do before accepting that position and promoting that problem. Okay, turning to um, the end point of the, of the investigation, uh, two questions from students, Abby, Brittany. Um, you guys can both pose them. They're very similar questions. Hi. Um, hi. My question oh, hi. <laughs> was... Um, at which points, if ever, like, did you pause and kind of reflect on your decisions and kind of what the implications of your character ethically were? 
And my question is, before the federal investigation was apparent, was there ever a point where you wanted to confess or back out? Right. So, no, no. It, it, what happened was everything was great or seemingly great, and then, boom, it got horribly bad. I mean, sales were great, morale was great, attitude was great, and then I get a call from a lawyer telling me that I have been moved from a person of interest to the subject of an investigation and I'm pending to be a target of an investigation. And at that point in time, you know, I almost didn't even have time to think. I mean, I, I you know, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would be under criminal investigation and ultimately, you know, go to prison. Um, so I just, um, I reflected, I mean, honestly, the time where I did the most reflection was, believe it or not, I mean, yeah, when I pled guilty, um, I started to heal, you know, and come to terms with what I did, and it was, that, that was helpful. But it wasn't until I actually went to prison, self-surrendered, and uh, because of COVID, they had to put me in, um, what do they call it? Uh, well, they put you in a cell. They put you in a five by eight cell by yourself, and you're in there 23 and a half hours a day for, for weeks. And, you know, I went from having breakfast with my wife, saying goodbye to my kids, and getting in a nice car, and driving down, and then... You know, 20 minutes later, the door gets locked behind me. I can't see. You know, I feel like I can't breathe. Um, and and I'm just thinking, whoa, like, what did I do? I can't believe, you know, I mean, it, for me, you know, it was a traumatic experience. And I lied down on that mattress, and I just started to think and think and think and think and just analyze and reflect. You know, for me... You know, the best way to, to describe prison for me is a very long, dreadful timeout for adults. And, you know, when you're a child and you do wrong and your parent puts you in timeout, they put you in timeout because they want you to think about what you did wrong. And for me, that's what prison was. And it was, it was a timeout, a, a really long, miserable, torturous timeout uh, with plenty of time to think about what you did wrong. And, um, you know, I've analyzed it 10 ways to Tuesday, a million ways. And um, I also think about the fact that the majority of people out there in this world, you know, that do wrong, they never get that opportunity to really reflect and think about what's going on, you know. Because um, the fact of the matter is, is very few people get caught. So uh, the next Two questions are very, very similar. Um, uh, Jorge, you want to go? And Morgan, you want to go? Yeah. Um, I was wondering how much further you think that this whole scheme and your involvement in it would have gone, barring government involvement. And then uh, my question is quite a bit of a hypothetical where um, – Kind of related to the last question too, but if incest had not been investigated and implicated, would there have been just a breaking point for you, either to leave the company or to become a whistleblower, just for you personally? Yeah. So, for, first, first of all, it would have went on forever. I mean, it's already been proven. It went on with Purdue and the Sackler family. It went on forever, and none of them did time, and they've got billions of dollars. Um. But for me, there was a breaking point. I actually resigned two times before, um, before I left the company. And even when I left the company, they kept me on as a consultant for a few months because they, they, they were afraid I was going to blow the whistle. I wasn't going to blow the whistle. Um, but yeah, I hit, I hit my breaking point many times. I couldn't, but at the end, it, it wasn't even so much about, honestly, guys, it wasn't it really even about ethics and morals. It was about my disgust for John Kapoor. I just, I had been in sales before and I had been successful and I had actually sold a schedule to opioid prior to INSYS. And we had been, you know, we, we, we made a lot of money, but we never crossed lines anywhere near to the extent that we did at INSYS. And 
okay, fine. So I crossed the lines and I went further and further and further. And he just kept wanting me to go farther and farther and farther. And there was a point where even I said, you know, this is, I've had enough. And quite frankly, I made enough money. I didn't want to, I didn't need to be a billionaire. I had, I had, I did, I had done well. And, um, you know, eventually I did leave. I mean, resigned twice and they counter offered and they threatened and I stayed, uh, which is no excuse because I could have left and I should have. But eventually I did leave. But by the time I left, it was too late. Um, and it was like a year later that I actually got indicted. So I think that uh, I, actually uh, Eakin was going to ask a question about regret, but I think you've already got to it because you talked about it in, in prison. Um, the next couple of questions have to do with the rationale and the thought process um, where you showed up at the U.S. Attorney's Office and you had the conversation with them and ultimately you agreed to uh, enter into a cooperation agreement. So Drake and Jenny, you've got the first set of questions and then the second set of questions relate to um, uh, Alex's decision not to use a lawyer. So Drake and Jenny, you're up next. Hi. Um, louder, uh, louder. Uh, hello. Here. Uh, um, what was the rationale behind coming forward and cooperating with the government? And the follow-up? And mine is more straightforward. Is it, did you want to get a lighter sentence, or did you really want to make a full run doing it? Oh, right. So, you know, my, I have found it very refreshing for me just to be completely, you know, honest. So the answer to that question is both. You know, when, when you're in that kind of trouble and your life is literally circling out of control, you know, you want to try to look at everything, you know, because you've made terrible decisions and you don't want to make another bad decision. So for me, um, I mean, I, they, I wasn't, off, I, I agreed to cooperate. I wasn't offered a deal. Um, they promised me nothing and I had to be okay with that. Um, and I was because I had, I had had enough. Um, I had had enough quite quite a while before that, and so when the opportunity was presented to me to plead guilty and and um, cooperate in correlation with that plea, um, I welcomed the opportunity. I also had a tremendous amount of animosity towards John Kapoor. Um, I did not have any animosity or problems towards anybody else in the company, uh, but only him, and. I did not want to move forward on the same side or team or in alliance with him any further. And this was an opportunity for me finally to go my own path because for years now, you know, I was doing everything that I was told and I was following along and look where that got me. So I just decided I had enough. So you made uh, an interesting decision initially when you um, approached the U.S. attorney, and there were a couple of students who had questions about that. Hey, how's it going, Alec? I appreciate you being so forward about this, um, answering questions for us. So my question sure. is, uh, I was curious on your thought process going to the investigators for an interview without a lawyer uh, on your own. Right. I mean... And re yeah. related, one okay. related question, too. Sorry, Alec, this one is, is going to sound quite similar. Um, mine is a little bit different in that it, I, I'd like to ask you a question about sort of the industry as a whole. You know, this decision to go and speak to the Attorney General's office without a lawyer, is that indicative of a culture perhaps at INSYS or even wider in the pharmaceutical industry as, that sees regulators as sort of being, like, irrelevant or, or like, even stupid? Right, so you guys are you're educated, you're smart, and we all know that you never do what I do, what I did. Right, you never speak to anybody <clears throat> without an attorney if you think there's even an inkling um, that you're in trouble. Um, I was in a horrible way, you know. I. I just, quite frankly, at that point, didn't care. You know, I, my whole life I had been sharp. I had made good decisions. I got good grades in school. I had a fair amount of success. 
Um, I believe that my mind is very sharp now. I, I can tell the difference, you know. Um, but at that time, I was miserable. I was not living. I was uh, just going day to day in fear of, you know, what's going to happen. And I had attorneys that were um, provided to me by INSYS. And I felt that INSYS, because they were paying for my attorneys, were calling the shots. And that these attorneys were not really doing necessarily what was in the best interest of Alec, but, we, but were doing what was in the best interest of INSYS. And although I made a horrible and stupid decision to speak with these people without an attorney, I do believe that my thought process in that regard was actually pretty darn rational. Um, what I should have done is I fired them. I should have waited until I got new attorneys and got forward. But what I did was I fired them and just made an impulsive decision to go forward and speak to them. Um, I just wanted it over. And, you know, I figured I'd take a shot. <laughs> you know, you get in trouble, you're desperate, and you take a shot. But then... I figured, all right, they didn't buy it, so let's do this. Like, let's what? Let's make this. Let's let's let me deal with the consequences. Well, you know, that was in 2015, 16. I didn't go to prison until I didn't get sentenced until 2020. So my point is, you know, my whole life I've been trying to make things happen and on my own timeline because I'm a very impatient person and I'm used to getting things done and I like things a certain way. I'm a little OCD. And now for the first time in my life, everything is out of my control. And um, yeah, it was just a, a recipe for disaster. And I just had to just, con I mean, I, for four years of my life, from 2016 to 2020, you know, pending going to prison, you know, it was just a horrible, horrible time. I mean, I lost, I mean, I started with interest in 2012, it's 2022. Um, by the time I'm on probation, I mean, it's basically gonna be like a decade of my life that I lost to this. Alec, you made an interesting reference to lawyers being uh, given to you by INSYS, and this is a question students are going to be quite unfamiliar with, but um, you, may, you may know where I'm going with this. Did you initially enter, en enter into what's called a joint defense agreement with, with INSYS, where you agree ahead of time that your lawyers and INSYS, when I say your lawyer, your individual lawyer provided by INSYS can have all sorts of conversations with INSYS. Was there a joint defense agreement that was in place? Yes. Yeah, there was. Okay, so I want to make sure students understand what that is because it's really an unusual thing. Because um, ordinarily, if Alec had his own lawyer, his own lawyer would not be able to share with anybody else information Alex provided the lawyer. That would be protected by the attorney-client privilege. But if multiple defendants, including corporate defendants or other defendants, if they enter into what's called the joint defense agreement, all the defense attorneys can talk amongst themselves about things that would ordinarily be shielded by the attorney-client privilege. So I think I picked up on that, but my guess is students um, would not have picked up on that. Um, next question is, is kind of a, a shift in terms of what we're going to be talking about. And that has to do with, you know, what are the big lessons that you think um, that you've learned or others may have learned about how the pharmaceutical industry as a whole or doctors as a whole could learn from this so that it doesn't happen again? So go ahead. Jessica? Hi, yeah, so my question is twofold because it sounds like it, it took two to tango in this situation. Um, so from the pharmaceutical side, what regulations should be in place or changed to prevent this from happening? And also on the Medicare side. You mean on Medicare or medical? Me med medical, medical side. side. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, so on the pharmaceutical side, I mean, there is no one size fits all solution. However, I am, you know, I, I vehemently believe that any salespeople in pharmaceuticals should not be paid commission. They should be salary only. Now, even a salary still will drive them to push the envelope, right? Because they want to keep their job. 
and uh, probably, they still want to get a raise, right? Um, or a promotion. But commissions in pharmaceuticals yeah. should absolutely be out of You know, they should be banned completely. Um, you would get an entirely different type of person working for the company. I mean, so that's first and foremost. Um, as far as the medical side, you know, keep in mind the majority, the vast majority of doctors are good, really good, phenomenal. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware, but we work, we work tirelessly to weed out, believe it or not, to find the bad ones. We literally called on every doctor and quickly ruled out any of the ethical ones and stopped calling on them and called on the ones that basically were business oriented and wanted to do something that would be beneficial to them. Um, so that's not an easy task. And quite frankly, that's what a lot of these companies do. So I always used to tell my mom, um, the doctors that we deal with, I would never allow you to see as a patient. You know, so um, it's it's a, it's just very uh, it's very paradoxical. Um, the medical field in general is fantastic. It's just a couple of bad apples, and the fact of the matter is, is you know we're human, and in any anything in life, you're going to have some bad apples. Uh, okay, next two questions are going to come I'm from Elliot and uh, Kyle. So, yeah, so Elliot, you're first, and then Kyle, you can follow up with that one there. Hi, Alec. So my question was, um, how fulfilled did you feel in life holistically uh, while you're managing the sales team through the ups and downs of Insys? And then the related question is? And yeah, this one's pretty similar, but um, my question was, what were the consequences to your overall well-being, like especially your mental health for working for Insys? Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I didn't, I felt empty, you know, I thought that, you know, having that role and working for a company like that and, you know, supervising or overseeing so many people, making speeches in front of large audiences and so forth, uh, would be, you know, everything that I ever dreamed it would be, but... Um, I, I felt empty. I felt it was like I always I was missing something. I wanted more. Uh, it didn't help that you know, unfortunately, you know, my boss uh, was never happy, never satisfied. Um, you know, never gave me a pat on the back, and you know, always found something to complain about, which is one of the reasons why I left or tried to leave, and then ultimately did leave way too late. Um, as far as my mental health, I mean. It weighed on me. Um, I felt a lot of pressure um, while I was working at Insys. You know, I started to use uh, cocaine. Um, you know, almost every weekend. A lot of times, you know, I rationalized again. I was using it with customers, doctors, um, doing whatever I thought you know was necessary to uh, get the business and show these guys a good time and entertain and. You know, when I was working at Insys, Wolf of Wall Street came out, and I watched that movie, and boy, did I come out, like, on fire. You know, uh, it was just, uh, just not good, you know. Um, but even when I was being successful, and we were named number one IPO, and we rang the bell on NASDAQ, um, you know, I, I, never, I never felt fulfilled. So Alex, I get the, I'm going to take the last question here. And um, you, know, you talked about reflecting on things. And an opportunity that students have had to sort of look at this case study and, and talk with you, it sort of raises the larger question of, as you look back, um, what types of generalized lessons do you think can be drawn from the INSYS story and your story personally that can you know, help students think critically about making the right decisions? It's a big, it's a big question, and you know, I don't know whether it, it lends itself to a you know, two or three minute response, but I'll throw it out to you for sort of the last word. Sure. 
Um, I mean, I, I really think that, you know, we undervalue the importance of feeling good about yourself, about, you know, having, you know, the right amount of, you know, a good self-esteem, uh, you know, being happy with yourself, being confident, you know, feeling good about the way you look, um, you know, there's so many people out there, including myself, that are always trying to point out flaws in themselves and, and spend so much time focusing on those flaws that they become so impressionable. You know, if you're not confident and you're not happy and you don't enjoy life, you're a target. You know, and conversely, you know, if you're really confident and you're strong uh, in every aspect of your life, then you are the decision maker. You, you, you choose your own path. And as long as you choose your own path, you're in control, you know, of your own destiny. Um, but if you, if you don't have that right self-esteem and, and, and so forth and so on, you know, you could fall victim of, uh, of, of, you know, of, of a man like Kapoor. I mean, it, it happens every day to so many people. I mean, you, I think I was a school guidance counselor. I was a middle school guidance counselor. I remember those kids coming into my offices. I'm too short. I'm too heavy. I'm not smart enough. I'm this. You know, it's like, and I would see how they would be peer pressured, you know, and I, and I would say to myself, okay, this is why. This is why this student did this and does that. And I did the same thing as an adult, you know? And so I just think that you just, you, you, you pound your hand on the desk and you decide that you're going to be happy and grateful, you know, for your health and, and your well-being and so forth. And you move forward accordingly. And as soon as you don't feel comfortable or something doesn't, it just doesn't feel right in here, you know, you just, you got to walk. And I know it's easier said than done because when you become an adult and you have bills to pay and you have kids and you have pressures and, you know, your approach with an ethical dilemma at work and, you know, you think back to your days in school and you're like, okay, I should, I should quit. But then you're like, oh, wait, I have a mortgage. I have a car payment. You know, my kid, you know, is fighting an illness right now. I have hospital bills. You know, it's like, whoa, what do you do? Um, so, you know, now I'm really getting in depth. But, you know, one of my biggest regrets is, you know, you know, I just feel like maybe I should have been more entrepreneurial. Maybe I should have worked for myself. Maybe I should have been my own boss, you know, and. That's just something that it's a side note. But I think confidence and self-esteem and security. Um, not, I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talk, talking about an inflated ego. I'm just talking about feeling good about who you are and feeling comfortable in your own skin. I think that's the first step to ensuring that uh, you don't fall prey or victim. Uh, like, like I did and like many of the people that worked uh, at Institute. Alec, are we the first school you've talked to? Yes, you are the first. Well, on, uh, I think the student, uh, so I, I do think stu uh, students, I think students got a lot out of this today. Um, you have shown a great deal of candor. The answers that you gave to students in terms of their questions are, you know, thought-provoking questions and, and answers that you gave us. Um, we appreciate you spending time with us. I would encourage you, if the opportunity comes up again and somebody else sort of tracks you down wanting to talk to a university class, um, that, that you do it because uh, students will get a lot out of this particular opportunity. Um, I also have a copy of your book uh, that I will pass around to students. Um, my guess is that there's going to be some students who are probably going to reach out to you um, and probably acquire a copy. I will figure out a way um, that will allow you to sign them. I may just send you a bunch of three-by-five cards, and 
you can do it that way depending upon what students want to do um, with this. Um, lastly, I will give you a call um, tomorrow or the next day to sort of give you a, a bit of a, of a debriefing um, and also send you a copy of the, um, the Zoom link. So <laughs> on behalf of the students, um, I really want to thank you for being exceptionally generous with your time today, spending more than an hour and 15 minutes um, with us in fielding these questions. Um, like, like me, I think students really appreciate this opportunity to interact with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you all of you guys. Um, you guys provided me with tremendous questions, and I appreciate uh, your willingness and attentiveness. Thanks so much, Alex. Have a nice weekend. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, folks, let's take a quick break. Um, we had a super interesting, I'll pass this book around. You know, if anybody wants to get a copy of his, you know, book, I will figure out a way that, you know, we'll get them signed, probably the three by five cards that you can put in them. So take seven or eight minutes to debrief, to sort of come down after this, an intense hour and 15 minutes. Um, so take a break, get up, scratch. <laughs>
I'm sure. I think he just said I was like, I like him. I think he just said I like him. Like two months. Yeah. Oh, that's it. It was so So here are the answers to quiz three. Um, instrumental ethics policies provide rules and procedures for people to follow. That's true. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act forbids US-based companies, Boeing for example, from bribing foreign business executives, the president of the privately owned Japanese airlines, JAL, uh, to buy airplane jets. That's false. The Foreign Corrupt, Pro foreign corrupt Practices Act, you have to bribe a government official. You can't bribe a private person. Um, number three, the major drawback per the text of cost-benefit analysis is that it's difficult to assess the true benefits. I gave everybody credit for that one because I reflected on it and the book says it's difficult to um, formulate or difficult to address both the cost and benefits. Um, and so I thought, okay, that was a poorly drafted question, so everybody got credit. Even if you didn't answer it, you got credit for that one. Um, the major drawback Oh, I'm sorry, that, that's question number four. Um, that was the, the 
cost-benefit one. Um, the ethical problem described in the book where a manager might say something offensive, like foreigners have a funny notion about what's right or wrong, would be indicative of an ethnocentric mentality. That's true. Um, a manager or employee who puts his or her own interest above other considerations is called an ethical egoist. That's true. The primary government entity at the federal level that operates to investigate and police insider trading is the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Of the following major parts of the world, with all due apologies, this was right out of the book. A couple people said, uh, don't, don't draw the world this way, but it's right out of the book. Um, where would you go to find the least amount of corruption and the choices included? Um, a number of places. The answer was the EU. According to the text, the EU has the lowest uh, amount. Um, in class, we discussed the uh, problems with having a consulting service combined with an auditing service. It's a conflict of interest. Um, the um, auditors may go softer um, if they are under threat that the more lucrative consulting services are going to be taken away. Uh, <coughs> Heineken uh, made a misstep that was a cross-cultural contradiction or a cultural contradiction. Um, consider the in-class trolley experiment. Students were disinclined or unwilling to pull the lever. That was a duty-based or deontological perspective. Um, of Kohlberg's six stages of moral development discussed in class, name, the, uh, name one of the two that most are closely associated with childhood adolescence. Um, I gave a fair bit of partial credit because some students wrote number one or number two needed to be more than that. So it was um, avoiding pain or seeking pleasure. Those were the motivating factors for those two. Um, and the last one was if a person were to focus primarily uh, on things like character traits like honesty, trust, prudence, etc. That's indicative of virtue ethics. Um, so those were the uh, those are the answers to the to quiz three, and I will get those. I will bring them to the next office hours, so you'll have them. So what did you think, a Berlikoff? Um, I had one interesting observation uh, up here. Go ahead. I thought that was highly amusing. Um, what do you think? I'm just sort of curious. Let's just, I mean, what do you think? Yeah. He sure hates John Kapoor. <laughs> that didn't necessarily come through in the video. Yeah. does make a little bit more sense thinking about it that way. Yeah? When we talked about um, is it possible to have ethics and be a salesperson, and he said you have to choose the right product, my takeaway was that he's going to use these same tactics. He's just going to pick the product better. I mean, he did. He did. I mean, it was really interesting as you listen to him. You know, he sort of identified one of his key areas was shouldn't be selling a Schedule II narcotic this way. And I think that suggests that you may be on to something that, you know, he's, he may be willing to be this aggressive salesperson if it were widgets, truly widgets. Yeah, Kyle. I think he just, like, hasn't processed a lot of, like, the responsibility that he needs to take upon himself. It seemed like he was, like, passing a lot of it onto, like, John Poor or, like, like, wanting to make money. It, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Kind of yep. like sociopathic. So kind of sociopathic, yep. Yeah, on that note, I don't think he's sociopathic. Like, I think he does feel bad, but... I think he tried to play the victim still. Like, I was victim to John Kapoor and, like, victim to the circumstances of incest and, like, what they were selling. And if, if I had been entrepreneurial or if I had worked at a better company, this wouldn't have happened to me. But it's like, ah, you're kind of dodging responsibility in some ways still. Like, I think he definitely feels bad about his situation. It sounded like he had a bad time in the pen, for sure. But he, like, still doesn't realize that, like, he was the master of his own circumstance in a way, and he still was playing victim to us a little bit. I think you're right. I think he is playing victim to us in some. Did you buy his? Did you buy it when he he basically sort of fessed up to indoctrinating other people along the way to getting them to do things? So I think he sort of took responsibility in some areas, yeah. but then again, you know, his so just it, it is sort of interesting. Yeah. Nope. So like. 
are driven by like negative feelings that they have about themselves. Like they're in incredibly insecure. They they're really anxious. So those feelings are real, and he was being honest. And I think he was kind of getting to a, a step forward at the end where he's like, you have to feel good about what you do. I think that's great advice for him going forward. Like. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did not see that question coming. I thought that was just a really fascinating thing. It's not in the book. I'm going to share the interview tape with, uh, with Evan, um, and he'll take a look at it. And some of you may have noticed there was a third party who was watching at some point. Um, that's our guest speaker for next week. He's the Senior Vice President of Compliance at Microsoft. Um, his name is Herb Wilgus, um, and uh, he regularly comes in to my class, uh, and he wanted to listen in on this because he and I have both interviewed this guy named Brian Jorgensen, who was the insider trader, the last felon I brought to class before he went to prison. That was like five years ago. Yeah, Ellis. You thought it was a brag. <laughs> Get out of here. Get out of here. Well, he hasn't. I mean, if you think about it, all those interviews he did before were before going to prison. Prison, I think, has quite likely a way to chasten your experience. Yeah. I think Spooky, okay, yeah. So I, yeah. The other thing that like changed as part of my consideration of the whole case was that like, before I felt like he was a much bigger part and that like this whole system probably wouldn't have been able to run without him. But considering that he told us that he stepped away twice and everything, I feel like I misjudged that a little bit. Like he didn't have as much control as I thought he did. 
So some of you, I, I, I honestly think some of you, maybe over your holiday break, might want to pick up Evan Hughes' book and read it, particularly now that you know it's being made into a movie, um, so that when you go to see the movie, you can have read the book ahead of time and have even a, a more significant grounding um, in this. Um, I, when I, whenever I end one of these type of things, like a really interesting guest speaker, um, you know, uh, this is a unique opportunity. Yeah, he hasn't done this before. It's really a unique opportunity. Um, and I, I hope that you all are, I know that you appreciate it and, uh, you know, reflect on it a little bit because, uh, you know, like I say, I, I'm always like so, so psyched when I can convince somebody from uh, an unexpected area to come in and we can sort of make a little story arc out of it. And like I said, I'm going to try to gin something up, I think, next quarter where I do uh, even more with this, assuming he's willing to, to come back again uh, next quarter. So I had a really interesting experience. And I, I hope you guys did too. And the questions, you guys had, you guys have no idea. You guys wrote great questions. Um, and I apologize for hoodwinking you into doing it that way, um, <coughs> to sort of getting you to write these questions without knowing he was here. But if you looked at the questions, the structure of the questions, you guys are all sort of on the same page. You know, we had a lot of questions on compartmentalization and distance um, and rationalization and corporate culture and <coughs> your personal ethics and the role of businesses and whether businesses can be both ethical and profit driven. I mean, if you think about all these things we've talked about in class and you look at the list of questions that were put to him, you guys did a great job in terms of, of coming up with questions that really worked. Okay, somebody else's hand was up there. Andrew. I was saying for next quarter you should phone Kapoor and read <laughs> See if I can get Kapoor on the line as well. That would be, you know, Sunrise Lee might be available. Yeah. Might be able to get Sunrise Lee because she, 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 definitely, she definitely feels very much uh, taken advantage. She's out of prison too. Yeah. Um, I, did, I did find her on like Instagram or someplace. Maybe I'll try to track, track her down next. You guys can, you guys can go online and find, I bet you can, you guys are all very good. I bet, so here, I'll, like, I'll throw it out to you. If anybody can get Sunrise Lee uh, to respond to you saying she'll talk with the class, um, once class is over and grades are given, I'll buy you dinner, okay? So uh, you guys can take a, take a crack at getting Sunrise Lee. So, oh my God, I keep looking at the clock. Don't, don't, don't worry, that, don't worry that we're behind. I built in, I built in a huge amount of time for these lectures because I knew they were coming and there's another guest lecture on Thursday. So we were talking about utilitarianism and how utilitarianism can be used in, in really strange ways that you don't necessarily predict. So the study that I've got on the board, I'll sort of summarize it for you and see, see what you think of it. Um, <clears throat> this was a fascinating case that came out of the Czech Republic. And 22 years ago, they were having a debate in, the, in Czechoslovakia before it split um, about what to do with taxes on cigarettes. And the government wanted to raise the taxes on cigarettes because it's a sin tax, right? So you raise the taxes on cigarettes, fewer people buy cigarettes, fewer people smoke cigarettes, and fewer people get sick from cigarettes. So the government is saying, you know, let's, let's tax cigarettes so fewer people are buying them. Well, the industry doesn't want that to happen. The industry is absolutely against making cigarettes more expensive. Um, and they don't want this tax because they're going to see their revenues go, go down. And so they hire a consulting firm and they task the consulting firm with coming up with a utilitarian argument against raising the price of cigarettes and taxing cigarettes more. And the argument that was put forward turned out to be a really crazy, unconventional, kooky argument because it was all bottom line driven. It was all financially driven um, about why you shouldn't tax cigarettes. And the ultimate end point of the argument was it's actually going to cost us more money if we tax cigarettes today and drive down people smoking cigarettes. What do you suppose the argument was about? I, I took it out of the slide deck so you can't see it ahead of time because I don't want you to know where I'm going. I want to see whether you can puzzle through this. James, and it's a, I'll give you a hint. Super cynical argument. Yeah. Uh, okay, now I'm doubting myself, but I remember in economics, like certain taxes, when they put it on the businesses, just <laughs> passed on to the consumers, 
That's too sane. This is a really cynical argument. You're, that's a great argument. Too sane. This is like totally cynical. Yeah. exactly right. S say more. So what's the argument going to be? You're an, you're, you're an analyst for the cigarette companies. What's your argument going to be about why you shouldn't tax cigarettes? You're on, you're on it. Just make the argument. Because you're not going to stop people from You got it right. You got it. You got it. Anybody want to take, take it one step further? You're going to save more money as a government if a bunch of people die early in their life as opposed to living to 80 and paying a bunch of Social Security and medical benefits. So if you can keep them smoking, they'll die earlier, and the net will be a big savings that you will experience. Here's the math that they did as part of their utilitarian argument. Smoking related public finance costs. You know, here's all the things that the government would save um, in the long run if they just keep people smoking and dying early deaths. Now, as you might imagine, uh, that particular bit of consultancy done on behalf of Philip Morris um, got a fair bit of blowback out there. Um, no pun intended, uh, a fair amount of blowback back there, uh, and they walked away uh, from it because, of course, that's a ludicrous thing to be arguing, that we're better off in terms of saving money for society by trying to speed up the deaths of more people in our society out there. Um, so that's a crazy way that utilitarianism um, spun out of control. Um, Okay, let me just skip ahead. I'm going to see how many. Uh, so, so what are the other problems with utilitarianism? How do you factor in prices, monetary prices, for things like liberty and freedom? You know, if people's liberty and freedom are taken away, I mean, can you really price those things? It's very, very hard to do that. So in the United States, in the period after, um, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed by... Um, the uh, Japanese Imperial uh, Air Force, you know, we made a utilitarian de <laughs> decision in the United States that we were going to move Japanese Americans living on the West Coast to internment camps, right? How do you, how do you price that loss of freedom for all of those hundreds of thousands of people, and how do you compare that to the perception that the country as a whole, and again, this is completely misguided, but this is 1941 speak, or 1942 speak. How, how, do, you, how do you, you know, balance that claim by the, by the Roosevelt administration that we need to do this for the good of the country as a whole? How do you put prices um, on those things? Um, you know, same thing sort of cropped up uh, in 2015. There was that awful terrorist attack in Paris um, where the nightclub uh, was stormed by gunmen and a lot of people were killed. And, you know, Trump was at that point a candidate, but he comes out and he basically said he'd certainly implement, you know, policies that would, you know, lock people up based upon um, or track people based upon religious affiliations. So, you know, we can't really get away from some of these things. Um, in business, managers often have to make lots of decisions about short-term versus long-term uh, profits and ramifications of their decisions. You know, we live, for better or worse, it, when we're dealing with publicly traded corporations that have to report their profits every quarter in a short-term universe. So every quarter when financials are reported, that's, that's where we are right now. It's really tough when you're balancing that short-term window against much more long-term uh, windows and prosperity out there. Um, so the big problem with utilitarianism is it's often just so difficult to know ahead of time what the actual consequences of your decision are going to be. To do it right, you got to know who's going to be affected. This is utilitarianism, right? So if you have utilitarianism out there, to make it work, you got to know who's going to be affected by your decision. And then you got to be able to assess the positive and negative impacts 
and put it into financial terms. And then you've got to make that ultimate choice about the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, the next one I want to talk about, I'm just deciding whether I want to do this or not. Uh, yeah, we'll start. Is, is the rights model, do, you don't want me to do it? You guys are exhausted? You want, you want to quit early? Is that what you're telling me? OK, we'll quit early. Um, you guys are exhausted today. So next week we'll have Herb Wilgus. Herb will probably be here most of the day, and we still have a bit more to do what happens. I'm not worried about where we are though. Um, okay, have a good. Oh, where's my Aleph book? Um, where's the Aleph book? Where's it? Okay. So um, why don't we do this? Why don't um, so? Raise your hand if you think you want to get a book. Raise your hand. OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. OK, there's at least 10 or 12. So what I want to do, if you've raised your hands, um, I'm going to talk with him this weekend. And I'm going to tell him that at least a dozen people want to buy your book. I will get directions on how you can order it. And I will send him three by five cards. And that way, he can sign a three by five card for you, and you can take it into the book. It's going to be very difficult to have him mail books from his house with you um, if that works. James, question? Do you think he's going to start a spreadsheet tracking how many teachers he speaks at? And how he many might. There might be. That's right. There might be a spreadsheet. So I will, I will work with you guys about taking care of that piece. It looks like you've actually published the book. He might have. It may, be, it may well be. It may be self-published. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Todd. Yep. Nothing will ever be as traumatic as that. There's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Everything.